Let's talk about the Eisenhower years a little bit. Kind of to set the mood there, you've got the, the pictures up there. That's Eisenhower at the top right. The bottom picture is Vice President Richard Milhouse Nixon. The bottom, your bottom right picture as you're looking at it is a Strategic Air Command. It's our bomber fleet. The top ones are photos from, from wars at this time period. That's the U-2 spy plane that was shot down in Russia. So let's kind of see what was going on in this time period. We, we finished off talking about Truman and, and the problems he had in, in, uh, in Korea. We call this his malaise. Truman's malaise was where we hit this deadlock in Korea, where because it wasn't a, a declared war, it was a police action, we weren't able to take the war into Korea. In fact, uh, when Douglas MacArthur, I think I told you last week, when MacArthur did invade Korea, uh, illegally, he, he violated the president's order. He invaded and he pushed the Koreans all the way up into China. He ends up getting fired over it, and uh, and, and we end up giving all that land back. And land back. This war also creates an inflation problem. Now, that's a term that a lot of you don't know, but it starts to be heard a lot in the 50s, all the way through to today. Inflation is where the value of your money. Is not as if your money is not worth as much. It doesn't have as high of a purchasing power. Okay, they say your your money is inflated. It's just not worth as much. Uh, and war bred inflation is out of control. Keep that in mind. That's what the world is like in 1952 when we have an election. And this was a weird election because both parties offered the nomination to General Dwight Eisenhower. Both parties offered it to him because nobody knew what party Eisenhower was in. Eisenhower is a weird situation. He never voted in his life. He had never cast a ballot. That's not unusual, by the way. A lot of, a lot of your military men don't vote, and the reason they don't, particularly your officers, is because they have to work with whichever group wins, and they don't want to have any kind of a uh, I don't know, separation between them. So, the Democrats end up nominating Adlai Stevenson when Eisenhower choose, chooses not to run. But then, at the last minute, Eisenhower gets in as a Republican. And literally, the last minute, Eisenhower gets in the nominate, gets in and manages to win the nomination all within four months. It's only a four-month election cycle to win the nomination. That's unheard of today. Think about our last election cycle. We had people that were announcing two years out. Well, four-month cycle. His campaign slogan is, I like Ike. One of the best campaign slogans ever. Ike was his nickname. Uh, it's quick, it's easy, it, makes, it looks good on a button. It works well. So what makes this guy Dwight David Eisenhower, by the way, a native born Texan, although he claims Kansas because he moved there very young. What makes this guy Eisenhower such a uh, a good choice, or a, a or a I don't even know if a good choice is the right one, but a uh, a welcome choice to the American people. Well, first off, he had been supreme commander of all Allied forces in Europe during World War II. This is the guy that commanded not just the American troops, but the American troops, the Russian troops, the French troops, all the Allied troops. He was in charge of them overall. The guy that defeated Hitler, basically. Whenever the war was over, he had become supreme commander of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So again, he's in charge of all the allies that are trying to stop the spread of communism. Upon retirement, he comes back to the United States and becomes president of Columbia University. So he's got pretty good bona fides. And then the question happens in 1952. This is the, the deciding question. In a debate, they said, we have a problem in Korea. What will you do about it? And Adlai Stevenson is the first to answer. And he gives this long, drawn-out answer about how he thinks the answer to, to uh, uh, problems with Korea is negotiations. And he's going to go to Korea, and he's going to negotiate with the people to end the war. And it was a long answer. And then they asked Eisenhower, 
what will you do about Korea? And Eisenhower looks directly in the camera and he says simply, I will go to Korea. Now, what does that mean? I will go to Korea. Hmm. I'll tell you what Americans heard. They didn't hear what he said. What they heard is, I, General of the Army, Dwight Eisenhower, the guy that kicked Hitler's butt is going to go to Korea personally and take care of this. In reality, what he meant was, I'm going to go negotiate with him to end the war. Okay? They said the same thing, but Eisenhower has the ability to say that with credibility, while Adlai didn't. So Eisenhower wins. Wins pretty, pretty heftily. You can see all the red states went Republican. 442 to 89. Eisenhower even picked up several traditionally Democrat states, like Florida, Oklahoma, and Texas. What did Rhode Island do? <laughs> yeah, Rhode Island went red. Oh. At this time period, Rhode Island was still a pretty, was actually a pretty Republican state. Uh, you'll like this one, Tyler, because uh, uh, the way he used the media is incredible. Eisenhower had the very first televised presidency. Televisions were in every home by this point. And he was the first person to do televised press conferences. Y'all have all seen press conferences. We're used to them today. The president steps up behind the blue goose. That's the big podium with his symbol on it. Steps behind the blue goose and he gives a little speech and then says, Does anybody have any questions? And everybody yells out the questions and he answers them, right? It's not how it used to be. Until Eisenhower, press conferences weren't public. They would write down their questions, they'd send it to the president, and the president would take the time and answer them and send them back. But Eisenhower wants people to see that he's on top of things. So he starts having these televised pre press conferences. But he worked the media real well. You see, what he would do is he would seed the audience with people that were loyal to him with questions that he already knew what they were going to ask. So he'd go out there and say, are there any questions? Everybody would start yelling, and he would hand pick the people he called on, and they would throw him, answer, throw him questions that he already had rehearsed answers to. It allowed him to look like he was right on top of things. And, and he probably was right on top of things. Eisenhower was not a stupid man. But it worked well. The guy that taught him how to do this was his vice president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. I have to confess to, uh, to kind of liking Nixon for some things. We'll see when we get to his presidency, there's some things he did that I like. Uh, but Nixon was a crook without a doubt. He did some things that were very, very sneaky and underhanded. He, had a, he used to be notorious when he was a congressman for having an enemies list. And he would hire private investigators to go and, and, and investigate all of his enemies when he needed a law passed. And he'd show up at your house and say, hey, listen, uh, I know you weren't going to vote the way I want to, but I have these pictures of you with somebody, and that's not your wife, is it? And the next thing you know, they'd vote the way he wanted to. This is the way Nixon, Nixon used a lot of pressure to, put, uh, to uh, get people to do things. But he also had what they called a slush fund to pay for these things. This meant there was a lot of unreported campaign funds. That was easier to do back then. And it was money that he could just spend however he wanted to, and he used it to target his enemies. Well, a reporter finds out about this. And he writes this expose about Richard Nixon and his illegal campaign contributions. And Richard Nixon has this massive amount of campaign contributions that are under the table in cash and they're never reported. They're kids. Not illegal, not per se, but very, uh, very gray area how he did, did it, okay? Well, when Eisenhower finds out about this, Eisenhower wants Nixon to resign. Eisenhower's got a reputation for honesty. In fact, they called him Honest Ike. He doesn't want to damage that with Richard Nixon. But Nixon goes to him and he says, listen, 
let me speak directly to the American people one time. Let me go on TV, and if I can't convince them that I'm right, that this is just a witch hunt against me, I'll resign. And the president agrees to this. So Nixon gets some time period on television. They request it. Eisenhower requests it for him on all three networks, and that's back when there were only three channels to watch. And Nixon goes on television. He gives a speech that's called the Checker Speech. Now, guys, if you have any interest in, pick in, in politics at all, the first thing they ask you when you run for office is, is there anything in your background, anything ever in your background that could embarrass you, your family, or your party? And the second thing they ask you is, do you have a checker speech for it? Okay, which means you have a speech that's going to fix it. So Nixon goes on television, and he steps right in front of the camera, and he says, I have been accused of accepting illegal campaign contributions. Well, let me tell you, the buck stops here because the accusations are absolutely true. And the whole country goes, what is he talking about? He's accepting responsibility. He says, the, can't, the accusations are true. And he reached down under the podium and he pulls out this box. And inside this box is this little bitty cocker spaniel puppy. And he pulls this cocker spaniel, and it is the cutest little puppy you've ever seen, okay? He pulls this thing out. He says, I was going, going through Texas on a campaign stop, and I was, I was tired, and, and I had my family with me, and, and Pat's there with me, and we're, we're giving these speeches, and I've given this speech a hundred times by now. I was tired of giving this speech. They could see I was tired, and they could see the family was tired, and... At the end of the speech, this, this nice Texas family came up to me and they said, Mr. President, does your daughter have a puppy? And when I said, no, no, my, my daughter doesn't, have, doesn't have, have a puppy, they were shocked. They couldn't believe that this sweet, beautiful young girl didn't have a puppy. So they gave us a puppy. And they, hand this, they hold this copper spaniel up. It says, my daughter loves this puppy. My daughter named this puppy Checkers. And damn it, we're not giving back the puppy. And the whole country overnight flips. Richard Nixon goes from being close to being asked to resign to being voted Parenting Magazine's Father of the Year the next month. Because he managed to convince the world that the illegal campaign contribution that he accepted was a puppy and those evil Democrats are trying to take his daughter's puppy away. You can't take the puppy away. What kind of a monster would do that, right? Well, it turns out that accepting that puppy was an illegal campaign contribution. You can't do that. It is illegal to accept, accept uh, 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 gifts like that. But that wasn't what he was talking about. He was talking about about $100,000 worth of campaign contributions that he accepted. But he didn't bring those up. The checker speech made it all about the puppy. And it worked. Richard Nixon, uh, his numbers go up. Everybody forgets about the campaign contribution. Smart man. Smart man. So, if you run for office, have a checker speech. That's what I'm saying. The other problem that we have with this televised presidency is that we started soundbiting America. If you don't know what a soundbite is, a soundbite is 8 to 14 words. That's about how much America can, can function now and, and remember of a speech. It's 8 to 14 words. Didn't used to be true. We used to memorize speeches. We used to hear them and know them. And presidents gave beautiful speeches. Presidents used to give the Gettysburg Address. Presidents don't give speeches like that anymore. Presidents used to give Washington's Farewell Address. They don't give that anymore. Presidents now speak in sound bites. You've heard them. You know them. Uh, Yes, we can. That's a soundbite. Uh, George Bush, George Bush uh, Sr., read my lips, no new taxes. Ronald Reagan, there you go again. Uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush, we're the freest, fairest, and finest country in the world. Uh, Bill Clinton, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. 
all of these guys have sound bites in that time period. So that's changing. And it also threatens the party system because for the first time ever, a president can speak directly to the American people through a television and they don't have to go through the party bosses anymore. So the party bosses are not able to control a president like they used to be able to. This is also the age of McCarthyism. Joe McCarthy, <coughs> well first off he was a drunk, and second off he was a, a red baiter, he hated the communists, and he saw them everywhere. He thought everyone was a communist, particularly if you had a Jewish last name. And uh, in Wheeling, West Virginia, he gave a speech where he didn't like Secretary of State Dean Acheson. And he says, Dean Acheson has knowingly hired at least 205 registered communists in the State Department. 205 is a pretty specific number, right? And they said, uh, how many was that? He said, 87. What happened to the 205? Well, he backed off. But so how many said 57? The number just keeps changing. In the end, he's unable to prove even one. Now, after he dies later on, we find some evidence that he was right about a few. There were some communists in the State Department that were selling secrets. Um, but he probably didn't know that. He probably, uh, all the evidence looks that he was just red baiting, trying to see what he could get. Uh, Eisenhower doesn't trust McCarthy. Uh, McCarthy, uh, has massive hearings where he accuses people of being communists, calls them up before the House Un-American Activities Committee and the Senate Un-American Activities Committee, uh, HWAC and SUWAC. Uh, some of the people, just, just for your own knowledge, some of the people that were called up and accused of being communists, Lucille Ball, uh, Frank Sinatra, really? Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Are you serious? Ronald Reagan was called up because he was president of the Screen Actors Guild. He must be a communist because he ran a union. Hollywood was communist. Yeah. Uh, John Wayne at one point was called up. Now, they didn't take him very serious. John Wayne walked in and kind of growled at him and they backed off. Uh, in fact, John Wayne refused to speak. He went up there and said that I don't, that I, I, uh, uh, basically, I, I think y'all are, uh, you know, disrespecting your positions. And if you want me, I'll be outside and walked out. Uh, kind of interesting character was ultimately going to, going to take down, what's ultimately going to take down uh, McCarthy, though, is he's going to, to, to aim at the army. He's going to start accusing the army of being infiltrated by communists. That's a bad plan, because remember, the highest ranking person in the army at one point was the president, Eisenhower. That's going to stick, try and stick to Eisenhower. So Eisenhower is going to target him. He's eventually going to be uh, convicted of conduct unbecoming. And he's dead by 1957 of alcoholism. Was he a senator or a congressman? He was a senator. Uh, that's why I said H. Wack and Sue Wack. He ends up doing both. Let's talk about the segregated South a little bit. The South was still a very Jim Crow place. It was very much uh, a place where blacks had, had no, no real rights. Only 20% of eligible blacks were, were voting nationwide. If you were in the predominantly black states of Mississippi and Alabama, it's less than 5% registered of uh, blacks were registered to vote. 5% of eligible blacks were registered to vote, okay? Now, why is that? Well, it's because when you went to go try and, try and register to vote, there was a guy with a pillowcase on his head waiting there going, and your name is what? Writing it down and, and showing up at your house. <clears throat> so how are you going to deal with this? We're going to deal with this through something we call vigilante justice. If you don't know what a vigilante is, a vigilante is somebody that takes the law in their own, own hands. It's Batman, okay? But more likely, it's, it's uh, if you watch the old westerns, it's the posse that's gotten together and it's the lynch mob, right? Well, vigilance committees are, are rough. <clears throat> And they're trying to, to keep control of the South with an exploding black population. In 1946, you have six World War I veterans, I'm sorry, World War II veterans that are returning. They've been fighting in France. 
Now I want you to think about this. They've been in France fighting for French freedom. And when they get there, they discover that there is no segregation there. Blacks and whites can go to the same restaurants. They can do everything. So they're there fighting for freedom, when in reality, they would have had more freedom there under the Nazi sympathizer government than they had in the United States. So they come back, and they try and exercise their right to vote. All six of them are murdered for trying to vote. It's disgusting. This kid right here, Emmett Till, in 1955, he was 14 years old. He was hung, hanged, and beaten. Hanged until he was dead and then beaten until you couldn't recognize his corpse. Because he, quote, leered at a white woman. He looked at a white woman. Okay? He looked at her. And they hanged him until he was dead. I'm going to show you a picture of him. It's, a, it's disturbing. If you don't want to see it, don't look for a minute. Uh, but I think it's something that we need to at least be, be aware of out there. This is what was left of Emmett Till. Okay? So you can kind of see. I'm not leaving it up there very long. I'm not doing that because I think it's cool to show grotesque pictures. I do that so maybe you'll realize just how serious this stuff is. But how do we go about dismantling Jim Crow? The guys in this section are, are heroic to me. All these people that are protesting today, I, they need to go study these guys on how to protest. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, <coughs> had long worked hard to fight the segregation. And in 1944, they're gonna, gonna get the white primary ruled unconstitutional. Now you remember, way back at the start of the semester, we talked about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, right? That gave blacks the right to vote. The thing is, that was only in the general election. Because the general election is all the Constitution lays out. A primary election where you pick your candidates, those are private elections. They're owned by the parties. Every party makes their own rules. And in the South, we had white primaries where, in the, where you're, when you go to pick the candidate, only whites could vote. As a result, the blacks don't ever get a real choice uh, on, on general election day. Well, they sued, and they ruled that in the one-party South, where, every, where the Democrat always won, the one party south, the white primary was a real part of the election process. And you can't have, uh, you can't have a, an all white election. Uh, in Sweat versus Painter in 1950, they made the ruling that, uh, that you can't segregate people into separate law schools because they are inherently unequal. What had happened was uh, a, a law school, a black man had got admitted to a law school. And under separate but equal, they had created a brand new law school just for him. Problem is, the new law school met in a closet in the old law school. Mm -hmm. They basically had him in a broom closet. And he ruled, they ruled here that that ain't equal. That's just separate. Okay? So you've got to let them in, into your law school. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. You must know this one. You must, you must, you must. This is a big one. This one ends up on the STAR test every stinking year. Okay? 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Brown was a, uh, a successful, well, it was a little girl, but her father was a successful black businessman in Topeka, Kansas. And he lived right on the red line. Now, I don't know if y'all know what a red line is, but they used to have real estate agents would draw lines on a map, a red line. And the blacks lived on one side and the whites lived on the other. It wasn't a law, they just wouldn't sell property on either side. And the closer the black lived to the red line, the wealthier they were usually. They're closer to the whites. He lived right on that red line. He was right there. The most successful of the black community. And lives a couple of blocks from an elementary school that he wants his daughter to go to. Problem is, it was a white elementary school. Instead, they ordered him to put his daughter on a bus and ride 45 minutes to go to school. So he sues. In this case, they ruled that segregation is, in fact, discrimination. And in 1954, they ordered, the Supreme Court ordered every school in the United States to desegregate. They did that immediately? No, it took a long time. Uh, in fact, I don't know if y'all are aware, but there are 
Galveston ISD is still under a desegregation law today, a ruling today. They have two high schools in Galveston, and they keep resegregating themselves. Not by law, but what happens is they mix the mix it up and get the races all where they're equal, and then everybody moves, and you have one black high school and one white high school. They desegregate them again, and everybody moves again. That's what keeps happening down there. I think it was 63 here. Yeah, it was 63 here at Wells. It was 1970 in Jacksonville. It was 1981 in Greenville. So, I mean, it, it takes a while. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about the next one, Montgomery Bus Boycott in 1955. I love the story of Rosa Parks, and I hate the way we often tell it. And I hope you haven't heard it this way. I remember when I was growing up, I heard that Rosa Parks was just so tired. She worked so hard, and she got on that bus, and she just couldn't make it to the back of the bus. So she sat down, and that mean old bus driver threw her off the bus, and that caused the Montgomery bus boycott. Well, that's all nice, and I'm sure she was tired, but it leaves so much out. First off, anybody know what she was tired from doing? She was the secretary for the NAACP chapter right there in Birmingham, Alabama. The way the rules used to be, I don't know if y'all are aware, <coughs> they didn't really have a black part and a white part of the bus. They had a line in the middle, and the blacks sat at the back, and the whites filled up the front. But if they got, if the whites got to that line, then the blacks would have to get up and move, move back, and, they, and the line just kept moving. And so, at a certain point, you got kicked off the bus, even if you'd been on it first, okay? That line just kept moving. Well, Rosa Parks decides to test this, and they picked a bus driver that had the worst reputation around. And she got on that bus, and she grabbed a seat and picked a fight. There was one seat left, and it was her. she went and took it. The very next seat, the black line, right? Black spot. But there was a white guy that was part of the NAACP, and he got on that bus and he demanded that seat. And he wasn't a racist. Why would he demand the seat? He demanded the seat because he wanted that bus driver to throw Rosa Parks off. And when Rosa got thrown off that bus because she wouldn't move, now she has an excuse for the, the bus boycott. And her and a young pastor named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. organized the Montgomery bus boycott to show what, what was going on. That's heroic to me. She picked a fight with, with, with the guy and physically got taken off the bus. That's heroic. The other thing that's heroic about these guys is they didn't, they didn't get violent. They never raised their hands. They didn't have to. Instead, you know how they broke it down? All the black churches in Montgomery started a, a ride-sharing ride service. And right next to all the bus places, they put up a place where, where cars would come by and they'd wait and they wouldn't ride the bus. Instead, these cars would come by and pick you up and they'd just pick up the blacks and take them where they needed to go. For free, by the way. Now, they can't do this for very long, but the idea here is it turns out that about 90% of the passengers on the Birmingham bus lines were white, or I'm sorry, were blacks. So when the blacks refuse to ride, the buses lose money. Ultimately, the buses. It wasn't a law. It was the buses that decided we're going to desegregate. He broke them down economically. Genius way to do it. Genius way to do it. Now this top picture up here is Little Rock Central High School, 1957. Little Rock was a traditionally white high school, all white high school, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And nine black students, talk about heroic, Nine black students volunteer to be the first nine to be desegregated into this school. Volunteered for this. Now, think about how brave they had to be. They're walking into this school, and there was literally hundreds of people with signs saying things like, nigger, go home. The only good nigger is a dead nigger. They're holding signs up that say this crap. Pardon my language, guys, but it's part of the class. And these guys, instead of 
turning and running or dropping and crying or or whatever rational people would do. I'm sorry. They did the, they did the irrational thing. They went, they, they said, that's where I want to be. And they walked into that school. They had stuff thrown at them. They had bottles thrown at them. They had rocks thrown at them. And then when they got to the front door, the governor of Arkansas, a guy named Orville Faubus, is standing up there with a baseball bat. So they say Forrest Gump. Yeah, yeah. Forrest Gump did a bad version of this. You're right. Forrest Gump did a bad version of a lot of stuff. Horrible movie. All right. <laughs> Movie just celebrates stupidity. I can't stand it. All right, so he's up there with his baseball bat saying segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. We are never going to desegregate. And he called out the state guard, the state army, to keep them out. Well, Eisenhower's not going to have that. Eisenhower comes out and says, look, the Supreme Court says you have to desegregate. You're going to desegregate. He nationalized that state guard, and the same guards that the, that the governor had called out to keep them out, he now orders them to escort them in. These nine kids all got in. They all graduated. A couple of them took an extra year. But they all graduated. And a few years back, I went through Little Rock. It's probably been 10 years ago. And Little Rock High School... Uh, was predominantly black men. Now, I've been told by a college student I had a couple of years ago that it's since closed and it's a historical monument now. I I'm, I'm not sure if that's true or not. But uh, the, uh, that's heroic to me. I can respect the hell out of that. That bottom picture is at a Woolworths pharmacy, the, the old pharmacies that you could go to and, and, and have soda fountains and all. Uh, and the rules... These old soda fountains were, they had a window, and, and the blacks could come to the window and they could order, but they ate their food outside. They couldn't come inside. There was no place to eat for them. Well, these college students from Eastern Carolina University decided they'd had enough of that. It was a hot day. They were going inside, and they walked in and they sat down. Now, this waitress comes up and says, uh, you, well, what can I do for you? You're not supposed to be here. He says, ma'am, we'd like to eat. She says, well, people in hell would like water, too, but, but, but you, can, you know, they don't get that. You don't get this. You, you have to get out. They wouldn't leave. Now, they didn't fight. They sat there peacefully. And they said, well, ma'am, if you don't feed us, we're just going to take the space up here. You're not going to be able to use this space. We're just going to sit here all day. And they did. They sat there. Now, yeah, there's, people came up, and they dumped food on them. They dumped, they dumped their drinks on them, whatever. And these guys sat there. Local radio station picked it up, and the next day, <coughs> excuse me, the next day even more show up. Within a couple of days, these city movements are breaking out all over the country. Eventually, they're able to break it down, and they break, break it down economically. Again, if you can't use the seats, uh, you can't sell the food. And uh, the trick is nonviolence. Now, I say they're heroic. I also say I couldn't do what they did. I couldn't have sat there and let people treat me like they did. Uh, I wish I could, but uh, I'm not. I'm not the kind of hero that could do that, I guess. All right, so what are Eisenhower's goals going to be? First off, he wants to roll back the military buildup. Uh, and second, liberate captive peoples. By captive peoples here, he means people behind the control of communists, behind the communist wall. He also wants to replace uh, the use of ground forces with bombers. We call it Strategic Air Command, SAC. We had a massive fleet of bombers, and Eisenhower's plan was, roll in thunder, baby. If, uh, if you mess with the United States, we aren't going to put ground troops on the ground and, and get our men in danger anymore. We are just going to bomb you into the Stone Age until you submit. Uh, and that's kind of been our, our method of warfare ever since Eisenhower. If you've watched the news recently, it's kind of what we're doing right now in Syria. Uh, he did threaten to nuke, uh, nuke China over, over the Taiwan issue. Now, we didn't do it, thank, thank heavens. Uh, he tries to work with Nikita Khrushchev. He seems to be doing pretty well. 
and then Vietnam is going to hit us. Vietnam is a quagmire. That's an SAT word, by the way. A quagmire is, is something that, that the more you struggle with, the deeper you get in. Think of it as quicksand. Okay? The, the harder you struggle against it, the, the, worse, the worse the situation is. That's what Vietnam is. Let's talk about how we got into Vietnam. Vietnam was a French colony called French Indochina. This guy, Ho Chi Minh, was a Vietnamese nationalist who believed that Vietnam should be free of France's control. And he was inspired by our American Revolution and Thomas Jefferson. He, in fact, contacted the American ambassador and said, ask for America to assist him because he wants to declare independence, just like we did. And he wants to establish a Vietnam along the same standards of the United States. Well, we chose not to participate because France is our ally. And we won't face off against our ally, France, a colonial power. Instead, we decide to help the French. The French try and put the revolution down and we went in to assist them. Well, at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the Vietnamese defeat the French army, and the French just give up. The French say, fine, we can't do this, and they pull out of Vietnam, leaving us holding the back. Now, what, what should we have done? We, we should have gone, well, our reason for being here was we were helping the French. The French don't want Vietnam anymore. They gave up. Let's go home really should have done has not been there in the first place. But instead, we're not going to admit defeat. So we started going in and trying to trying to push back with Vietnam. A Vietnam that had become increasingly friendly with the Soviets because we wouldn't help them. The Soviet Union did. And Ho Chi Minh ends up becoming a communist. Vietnam is ultimately divided at the 17th parallel. Ho Chi Minh will run the communist North, North Vietnam and Go Din Diem, that's him down there shaking hands with Eisenhower. Go Din Diem will, he will head the democratic western friendly south. It was really a puppet government for the U.S. and, and France. Uh, Go Din Diem was a terrible choice. He was a puppet that we put into place. He was Vietnamese, but he was raised in France. He was from a wealthy Vietnamese family. He spoke French as well as he spoke anything else. He was Roman Catholic in a nation where everybody else was Buddhist. Uh, he dressed Western. He was, just, he was really a Westerner. And the people of Vietnam hated him. In protest of what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam, you had guys like this Tibetan monk that were lighting themselves on fire. It's called self-emulation. Dousing themselves in diesel and lighting themselves on fire. And they did it to get the attention of people your age. They want the attention of teenagers and 20-somethings. Would this get your attention? Got yeah. my attention. This is their billboard. They're saying, look, your country is doing this to us. It's so bad that I'm willing to light myself on fire to get your attention. Stop this from happening. And they did. Or they tried to. The youth movement is going to find themselves to be on the side of, uh, of Vietnam. Go Dien Diem is going to be assassinated in a coup d'etat. This is what happens to, uh, to leaders that, that puppet leaders will be put in. And Vietnam is very unstable at the end of, the end of Eisenhower's term. Iran, let's talk about what was going on there. Iran decided to nationalize their oil fields. That means all the oil in the ground, they want to turn it over to the people of Iran, where it's owned by the government. The problem is the single biggest uh, controller of oil is Standard Oil, a U.S. oil company. We don't want that. So what do we do? We do something really weird for a democratic country. We were so wrong here, in my opinion. We found this guy, Mohammed Reza Pahlavi. 
Muhammad Reza Pahlavi is the descendant of the last king of Persia. Persia is the old name of Iran. <clears throat> Persia had not had a king since the early 1700s. They had been a democracy for longer than the United States had been a democracy. But the U.S. recognized this guy, and we told the people of Iran, this is your rightful leader. And we started a revolution. We overthrew the government, and we put Mohammad Reza Pahlavi on the throne of Iran. He becomes the Shah of Iran. That's him there in the middle. Now, I will say that under the Shah, Iran does very well economically. They westernize. They build colleges. Women get rights. But they also become a very Western-friendly, Western puppet government for a while. This is why the Iranians hate us still today. He's going to run Iran until 1979 when he's going to get overthrown. Okay? By the way, it's a picture of him with all of his wives. Why? Yes. Four. Egypt. This guy in the middle is, is Gamal Abdul Nasser. Nasser is a, uh, he's really a Nazi. They don't call it that there. He's a Baathist. That's the same party that Saddam Hussein was, uh, was in in, uh, uh, in Iraq. He builds a dam on the Upper Nile River in order to consolidate power. What he does is when elections come, he builds this dam and he shuts off water. And he tells people, either elect me or you're not going to have any water and you're, you'll all die. Starving his own people. Very, very, uh, very much a humanitarian crisis. Well, we don't like this much. We withhold oil from him. He laughs at us because he has more than enough oil. Then he nationalizes the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was dug by the British. It connects the Mediterranean at the north, that's the blue up there at the top, with the Red Sea at the south down there. So it, it lets you go from the Mediterranean into the Indian Ocean without having to go all the way around Africa. Okay? He nationalizes it. Well, we don't like that much. So France, England, and Israel go to war with them in 1956. The U.S. sits out of the war instead. We just withhold oil. But for the first time in history, United Nations troops are used as peacekeepers. Eisenhower comes up with his own doctrine. The Eisenhower doctrine says that the U.S. will give military and financial aid to any Middle Eastern nation that is endangered by communism. From this point forward, we have promised that if communism tries to spread in the Middle East and you're willing to fight it, the U.S. will be on your side. Okay? This is why we still today aid Israel. Okay? Nineteen fifty six we have another election. It's a repeat. The same election as we saw in fifty two. Eisenhower versus Stevenson, and it kind of comes out the same way. Four fifty seven to seventy three. <coughs> Eisenhower wins re election, but he loses control of of, of uh, both houses of Congress. I want to talk about the space race a little bit. And Sputnik. This picture up here is of a satellite. The very first satellite put in space. The Soviet Union launched it. And I'll tell you what this was. This was a ball a little bigger than a basketball. It circled around the Earth and it went beep, beep, beep. And it scared the hell out of us. That's all it did. <laughs> and it scared us to death. Why are we scared of it? Two reasons. One, they did it first. And two, if you can put that in space, who says you can't put a missile in space? We're afraid of weaponizing space. We were terrified. In 1957, they put not one, but two Sputniks into space. The same year, we discovered there was a missile gap. The Soviet Union had more missiles than we did for the first time ever. Not only do they have, have nukes, they have more of them. And we're embarrassed at every turn. We decide we're going to launch our own missile, the Vanguard missile. This is supposed to be our way of putting a missile in the space and putting our own, own satellite up there. Well, we put it on international TV for everybody to see it. And you hear the countdown. Three, two, 
one, contact, ignition, blast off, and the smoke starts going up and the rocket raises about 20 feet and it falls over and explodes. <laughs> the Vanguard missile fit. <laughs> Somebody worked so hard on that. Spent years building it and then it just fall down. By the end of the decade, we're able to, to close the missile gap. We, we, we did catch up with that. And uh, by the end of the 60s, we, uh, we outdo the Soviets in, in, in the space race. But it's going to take a little while. It's going to take a little while to get there. Honest Ike's honesty is tested. Uh, Eisenhower is actually at a United Nations meeting giving a speech called the Free Skies Initiative where he tells the world that the skies above a nation are sovereign territory and they should be free of, uh, of any enemy, uh, enemy aircraft. You're not free to fly over someplace that's not free land. <coughs> and actually condemning the Soviet Union for doing flyovers over, over countries. Well, while he's doing this, it turns out that we have a U-2 spy plane flying over the Soviet Union, taking pictures illegally. A U-2 spy plane was an awesome plane. It was technically a spacecraft. It flew so high that the pilots had to wear pressurized suits, okay? But this U-2 plane, it had no def it had no, no guns on it or anything, nothing to defend itself. Because its only defense was, it flies so high, nobody can hit it. Nobody had ever been able to. You can't prove it's up there, but it would take pictures from space like satellites do. Well, apparently the Soviets got lucky. They hit it, and they knocked it out of the sky. So imagine this. You've got the president giving this speech about how we shouldn't be spying on anybody. In the meantime, they shoot down an American spy plane. <coughs> I at first denied that. He says, that the Soviets are lying. Well, it turns out that Gary Powers, the guy that was flying, it survived, and the Soviets caught it. So they paraded Gary Powers out, and Powers said, yeah, I, I was spying on the Soviets, you know. And they, uh, so I have to admit that, that we, we were breaking the rules. Uh, Cuba? You ever wonder how Cuba became an enemy of ours? This guy at the top, Fugencia Batista, he was our guy. He was our ally. We liked him. Uh, we gave him aid and millions of dollars for the Cuban people. The problem is most of it didn't get to the Cuban people. It got to him and his family, and they lived like rich people while the rest of Cuba starved. Oh. Uh, but we liked him because he let us go there and build casinos, and, and we could own the, the, uh, the sugar plantations, and everything was great for us. <coughs> but the people of Cuba didn't like him. Enter this guy, Fidel Castro. I want to talk about how, how baseball could have changed the world. You know, Castro loved baseball. He was one of, notoriously a great baseball player, one of the best in Cuba. And he had one dream in life. He wanted to play for the then Brooklyn Dodgers. As a young 18, 19-year-old kid, he comes to America and he tries out for the Brooklyn Dodgers. His fastball wasn't quite fast enough. Just a little slow. So they put him on a farm team instead, on a minor league team, to strengthen his arm and, 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 and with the intention of bringing him up later. Castro was insulted that the, he, the greatest ball player in Cuba, would not get up a place on the Brooklyn Dodgers. And instead of staying in the farm leagues, he decides to go back and lead a revolution in Cuba. He goes back, leads a revolution, and ends up overthrowing the government of Batista. Think about it. If Castro's fastball would have been a little bit faster, we might never have had the Cuban problems. Well, he comes back to Cuba promising land redistribution. He says, I'm going to overthrow this guy. I'm going to take the land away, and I'm going to redistribute everybody. He's a communist. He's allied to the Soviet Union. And he keeps all his promises. And the people of Cuba were better off under him than they were under Batista. Without a doubt, they were better off. Uh, for a little while. Now, in the long run, were they better off? Probably not. But in the short run, they definitely were. Uh, in 1961, 
because he allies with the Soviet Union, we break off all diplomatic ties with Cuba, and they remain broken until last year. The last, the last year of Obama's administration. So that last, I think that was last year. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. Last year was 17. Well, 2016 is the year that that, that we uh, that we we broke it and started started meeting with uh, with, with Cuba. So from 1961 until 2016. There's no diplomatic ties at all. All right. We'll finish this lecture on Wednesday. See you guys later. Mr. Albert,